so much, Dr. Singla. And, and I just wanted to, again, thank um, the um, Beacon team for um, allowing us to, you know, come in and uh, talk to you all today about upper tract urothelial cancer. Um, we know that this is, you know, an uncommon presentation of urothelial cancer, and um, and we're just thrilled that, um, you know, Beacon is a, a safe place on the internet that our patients can go to get information about the disease, and that um, and that you really raise awareness of the disease. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist, and, and you, you're, you know, you're hearing from a medical oncologist that give intravenous and oral therapies for urothelial cancer, as well as a surgeon, a urologist, Dr. Singla, today, because we really do have a partnership in how we treat this disease. And, and our decision about um, how we're giving the presentation today is no accident. You know, Dr. Singla is uh, oftentimes the point person uh, when patients present with uh, urothelial cancer, whether or not it be in the bladder, the upper tract, or both, um, and the, the main person who would treat a low-grade tumor, uh, tumors that are low-grade under the microscope, they do not, as far as we know, re respond to systemic treatments, IV or oral treatments that we, that we would give, um, at least at this point in time. That may change in the future. We'll see with research. But um, and so really, you know, we don't, we don't tend to see those patients with low-grade upper tract disease. As you mentioned, it's topical therapy. For high-grade disease, this becomes more of a multimodality discussion with, you know, at least um, urology, medical oncology discussion. And then, of course, you know, our other colleagues um, that, that help us take care of our patients, pathology, radiology, nephrology, and others. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about um, that neoadjuvant or preoperative as well as postoperative uh, chemotherapy. What do we know uh, about the use of chemotherapy in upper tract disease? So um, I know Dr. Singlet had alluded to this level one evidence or you know, uh, large populations of patients that have been treated in clinical trials over the course of decades with muscle invasive bladder cancer and the design of those trials have let us um, you know, to better understand what a current standard of care is for an invasive bladder cancer, which is to give a cisplatin-based chemotherapy prior to surgery that provides best outcomes for patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Because patients with upper tract urothelial cancer that's high grade are um, a less common population and because more of them are not great candidates for platinum-based chemotherapy, uh, and that's because of the drug is metabolized by the kidneys, also potentially toxic to the kidneys. We have very few prospective, meaning moving forward in time, clinical trials, and those designs are what best inform and help us kind of change or alter and update standard of care. Um, so this is um, just a, a, a summary of some clinical trials um, that, uh, that are out there. These are prospective studies. Um, one that we did through, um, uh, through what's called a cooperative group, bringing a lot of different um, uh, uh, cancer centers together. Uh, the second one, uh, Dr. Coleman did, and this was just recently updated at a, a recent um, a national meeting, looking at um, a, a regimen of cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and then uh, kind of two other you know, historic ones, just providing um, some evidence for the use of preoperative cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Next slide. So the issue is that, um, as, as Dr. Singh alluded to, the, trying to stage upper tract urothelial cancer, trying to understand whether or not this is a, a tumor that's invasive is really um, challenging. And so the rules of um, who may get preoperative chemotherapy, who may qualify for preoperative chemotherapy, aren't exactly the same as those with bladder cancer. For bladder cancer, the rules are pretty clear. You have to have a specimen that has muscle in the specimen and then tumor has to be invading into muscle. For upper tract tumor, that's not usually possible. It's just the, the way that the ureter, which is like this long straw is designed and the way that the tumor is gonna grow off and uh, the equipment that's used, you're not often getting a ton of information. So we're using um, both you know, radiographic information as well as the, the pathology to decide who is and is not an optimal candidate to get preoperative chemotherapy. Once patients have the curative surgery and have a nephroureterectomy, 
you know, even our population where most, a lot of patients aren't always good candidates to get platinum-based chemotherapy, have to be very fit, very robust, have pretty good kidney function, um, pretty good cardiac function because we give a lot of fluids, you're gonna pump those fluids through the system. Um, no evidence of significant hearing loss because platinum can impact that, as well as numbness and tingling in the fingers and toes. So as you can imagine, in a population of patients with an average age in the mid seventies, there's not a lot of you know, optimal candidates for that treatment. So the number of candidates go down significantly in the post-op setting. So it's a decision about whether or not to give chemotherapy with incomplete information in the pre-op setting. And someone has two candidates and maybe a better candidate for chemotherapy versus thinking about doing it in the post-operative setting when you have more clinical information, a complete staging because the kidney and the ureter are out and we understand what the stage of the cancer is, but maybe not an optimal time to give the treatment. So we're, we're always living in this, in this balance and, and um, trying to interpret all this information when we meet patients in clinic. Next slide. Um, so th this is what's called a design of a um, clinical trial. Uh, this is a clinical trial that's up and running now, actually across the country. And um, the design of this study is put together with you know, teams of physicians, um, so medical oncologists, surgeons, um, other advocates, um, and statisticians to try and influence or update standard of care. Um, so this is just an example of what we're doing in what's called the cooperative group um, through multiple different cancer centers across the country, trying to decide whether or not a standard chemotherapy with a four-drug regimen called MVAC would remain a standard that we can give pre-surgery, or should we add an immunotherapy drug called Dervalumab? Um, so that's the main part of the study. We're looking to enroll about 220 patients. And another arm of the study that will be much smaller, more what we call hypothesis generating, is to see um, what are the outcomes for patients who are not great candidates for that platinum-based chemotherapy using a non-platinum regimen with immunotherapy. So as we're talking about clinical trials, we want to just present what a current example is of a large clinical trial going on in upper tract disease as we speak. So what about post-operative chemotherapy? So a lot of our patients have heard about the, the PALT trial and, and, and you know, kudos to um, our European colleagues, Dr. Allison Bertel and, and her colleagues that have done this trial because it's really the first large scale clinical trial that's been done solely in upper tract disease. So as we've said, you know, because upper tract urethelial cancer is a subset of all patients with urethelial cancer, Depending on the clinical trial, you can have, you know, sometimes up to, you know, 10, 20, even 30% of patients in a clinical trial that may have upper tract disease, depending on the study. Some are just bladder cancer, but, but others incorporate every, everybody. But this is the first really big trial that was completed in upper tract disease. And so this is important because I think this communicates, you know, to physicians, to patients, to advocates, to industry, that this is a space that really is its own entity and that clinical trials can be done and that you know we'll learn more by doing this kind of research. So essentially in this clinical trial, patients with upper tract disease, they weren't referred for chemotherapy before surgery, they were uh, referred only after surgery. And part of the reason that this trial worked in Europe is because that is their kind of European standard um, and everyone felt comfortable with that standard. So patients with a locally advanced tumor invading into muscle or lymph node positive were randomized, half um, just were observed with surveillance, follow-up scans and cystoscopies, and the other half got chemotherapy, and that chemotherapy was predicated on their kidney function. Next slide. And what these, um, what's called Kaplan-Meier plots have shown is that the three-year disease-free survival of the time where someone did not have recurrence of metastatic disease was significantly influenced by whether or not they received this post-operative chemotherapy, whether or not that was cisplatin or another drug called carboplatin. And it was an um, estimated absolute difference of about 25%, which is really important. Um, same as metastasis-free survival. So um, this was, these were the, um, the, the curves that showed a statistical benefit in, in terms of getting that chemotherapy. And this is what changed standard of care um, where, um, 
where really the push for you know, more chemotherapy in the post-operative setting came about. Um, the statistics didn't work out exactly for what's called overall survival. There may be different reasons for that. Um, one of them that everyone kind of hypothesizes is that there were um, the patients who were giving carboplatin and cisplatin were looked at in the same way. Um, and sometimes that can affect the statistics, we don't know. But despite that, I think Herculean effort and a huge congratulations um, to this team because I think they really kind of changed the face of uh, what we understand about this disease. Next slide. So another um, standard that has come about in the last um, year or so is using uh, a standard of care immunotherapy drug, FDA approved for urothelial cancer, as well as many other kinds of cancers, uh, but using in the post-op setting. So in this clinical trial, the drug called nivolumab was given um, to, uh, again, a randomized uh, design where half the patients were just followed and half the patients were followed and given nivolumab. Um, and in this study, patients could have gotten preoperative chemotherapy, or potentially they were in that category where they really weren't great candidates to get chemotherapy. And I'm just pointing out that about 20% of this population of all comers with urothelial cancer had upper tract disease. So a, a substantial amount, but again, the study wasn't designed just to look at upper tract disease. And what this study showed, next slide, was just like in the PALT study, that there was an improvement in what's called the intent to treat population, meaning all comers, um, in terms of the disease-free uh, survival at both six months and 12 months. Um, it was pretty significant. So the nivolumab pa uh, treated patients were in green and the patients who were treated with placebo were in yellow. Um, the patients alive and disease-free are on the top and the separation of the curves is the difference between getting a treatment and not getting a treatment. So this is something that we look at a lot in medicine. The biomarker called PDL1 was also looked at on the tissue of these patients. And, um, and that may have some influence on the outcomes, but despite that, you know, this is an option uh, for some patients that we will talk about that have urothelial cancer, uh, upper tract disease. Next slide. So I just wanted to give a landscape of um, treatment in the advanced setting. Um, just to get a sense of you know, where maybe a treatment you may have received maybe on, um, on a landscape. Um, so looking at um, kind of where we are currently in terms of the tools available to treat advanced urothelial cancer and whether or not that's upper tract urothelial cancer um, or bladder cancer, if someone presents with a metastatic disease, meaning tumor that's moved outside of the organ into other areas, then we'll treat with a frontline or first step platinum-based chemotherapy, carboplatin or cisplatin, for patients that have what's called a clinical benefit, meaning that they uh, have disease control. There's now this option to kind of extend that disease control with immunotherapy, and we can use a drug called Evelumab, um, FDA approved for urothelial cancer. Um, for patients who um, have disease progression or the cancer gets worse on platinum-based chemotherapy, or for patients that are not great candidates to get chemotherapy at all, we could start with one of the immunotherapy um, agents and that's noted in green. We do next generation sequencing, looking for mutations or changes in the tumor. And the reason that we do that is because we wanna know, can our toolkit be expanded to include an oral targeted drug that works on this change or mutation called the FGFR3 mutation, fibroblast growth factor three, that's present on really a minority of high-grade urothelial cancers, more commonly seen in low-grade tumors, but can we use that drug? So if a cancer kind of tells us it's dependent on that pathway, then that's a drug that we can potentially use. If it's not, then we, of course, would spare patient cost and toxicity and use alternate agents. Um, so that ertafitinib drug, that oral targeted drug is in yellow. And then finally, we have two antibody drug conjugates. So these are encapsulated chemotherapy agents that are attached to an antibody. And I kind of think of those like a heat-seeking missile of chemotherapy, an updated version of chemotherapy compared to platinum-based chemotherapy, which was designed decades ago. This is more modernized kind of chemotherapy with the goal of killing the cancer and sparing the patient of toxicity. Um, so both of these antibody drug conjugates are approved. There's more drugs in pipelines, and so potentially this slide might look different if we're invited to give a follow-up a year from now. 
but this is the current treatment landscape for advanced urothelial cancer, bladder and upper tract. Um, in terms of resources, I think one of the things that um, Dr. Singla and I are often doing is providing patients with and families with information about their disease. It is not uncommon that patients will maybe meet me in clinic that, that are maybe referred from elsewhere um, who hear about where their tumor is and aren't quite clear, do they have a kidney tumor? Do they have a renal pelvis tumor? Where exactly is this? So I think it is important to have resources like the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, um, as well as our you know, own internal resources to refer back to, to have us, again, safe places on the internet to, to look up information, to read more about it. Because I think you know, it is, it's challenging to find, I think, accurate information about upper tract urothelial cancer um, kind of out there. And it's one of the reasons that we felt it's really important as a program uh, to develop a you know, specific medical home for upper tract urothelial cancer, um, where we really think about this disease a lot, we treat it, and, um, and really think about you know, accelerating the standard of care. And that's just our, um, our Hopkins team here. Thank you so much.